Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our field day. My name is uh, Selena Gomez, and uh, I am an assistant professor here at the University of Florida. I will be your host for today and one of the presenters for this uh, virtual field day, along with my colleague, Dr. Paul Fisher. Paul, if you can just uh, briefly introduce yourself. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Paul Fisher. Um... Uh, helping out Selena with today's uh, field day, and I work in research and extension here at UF. Um, again, we are just going to introduce this program, and we all know that that gardening has become uh, more and more popular in recent years, but especially in 2020, with uh, with the pandemic, there was uh, essentially a rediscovery of gardening activities. Uh, this enthusiasm for gardening uh, increased, and some say that this was fueled by um, uh, the fears of food insecurity that some people had, and and just uh, trying to be able to to at least grow some food at home to be able to provide to uh, the, the people at home. However, there are other uh, motivations and and other aspects of, of gardening that are pushing people towards uh, uh, growing food at home or growing vegetables at home. For example, people uh, want to be able to connect with nature. They, they want a sense of purpose and uh, creative expression. They also want to uh, work for something that will yield a tangible result. And uh, these are all, again, hidden motivations that are really pushing that increasing interest in gardening activities and making it a very important trend in horticulture. So um, last year, some people compared uh, vegetables to toilet paper and the shortages that we had here in the US with toilet paper. Well, the same thing happened with vegetables and seeds and, and everyone was running out and trying to get uh, all of this uh, different plant materials to be able to grow at home. And so that is great news for our industry. Uh, a lot of industry players saw a significant increase in, in demand for edible plants or for seeds. And some say that within a week they were able to see uh to sell what they would normally sell in in a month so um what was interesting is that a lot of the people who um participated in this gardening activities last year were not the usual uh, consumers who year after year go on and, and, and buy plants to grow during the summer. We this time had uh, a lot of new generation growers, let's call it a lot of millennials and, and urban gardeners who went in and, and were trying to grow compact plants in urban spaces. And, um, and so the good news is that according to several surveys that were published late last year, uh, about 90%, close to 90% of, of all these new gardeners are, are expected to come back and to continue to garden in this uh that this next year and hopefully beyond. So our hope is to enable the industry to continue to be on this era of post COVID-19. Um, other good news is that um, even before COVID hit, a lot of the breeding companies uh, had already begun developing this very interesting, great compact vegetables to cater to this market. And uh, the idea is that people with that extensive outdoor space can be able to produce and grow some of their own vegetables at home. And so we're lucky today to have uh, four industry representatives who are already big players in this space. And, and they'll be telling us a little bit more about their programs. So um, I'm going to just take a few minutes and talk about our research program because in the past few years uh, here at UF, Paul and I have been putting a lot of effort into trying to identify opportunities for our programs to support these growing trends and to support the industry. And uh, so today we're launching a new consortium, the Research and Urban Gardening Alliance. And uh, our hope is to uh, continue to collaborate with a lot of the industry players in this space and to continue to do research that helps growers, that helps consumers succeed and, and be able to um, pr produce excellent plants for this growing market. So we see three distinct areas of research that we want to continue to work on and expand the, the research that we've been conducting. 
Uh, one is to support the greenhouse industry and, and other suppliers who uh, sell products or services for the greenhouse industry who produces these plants to sell to consumers. And so there's different research uh, programs or different uh, objectives that we can have within this program. And here are a few examples. We can focus on, on, on evaluating what are the best plant products to sell to consumers. What is the best stage to uh, market these plants to a consumer? And so that's what I'm trying to highlight with this slide. I, I've included a, a screenshot from a social media post that I uh, downloaded uh, late last year. And it's just showing the frustration that some of these home gardeners have when they grow a plant from seed. And here's someone saying, I grew this in March and here we are mid-October and I'm still not seeing any fruit. So what am I doing wrong? And what we're trying to do with this program is to, again, enable consumers to be able to succeed and be satisfied when they engage in these gardening activities. So perhaps having someone uh, or suggest to consumers to buy a transplant or a plant, as you can see in the picture below, a plant that already has some fruit uh, or some flowers on it may lead to a greater consumer satisfaction than having someone start a plant from seed. Uh, what type of containers should be used to grow these compact vegetables or larger plants? And you'll see a little bit more of that in today's presentation. And the same thing can't be said with the type of packaging. So another uh, key aspect of this research um, to, to help consumers is to better understand some of the cultural practices regarding pest and disease control or fertilizer management. And that is because a lot of the, the people who or growers who are interested into increasing their portfolio and producing uh, of producing vegetables um, in transitioning perhaps some of the, the floriculture crops into vegetables uh, are not necessarily very familiar with the very distinct regulations that are in place for producing edible crops. And again, fertilizer, it's, it's very different to grow a floriculture crop compared to a tomato plant that will need to uh, or hopefully should be able to produce a satisfactory yield for a home consumer in that home consumer environment. And finally, cultivar selection. And that's what, what I've highlighted on this slide because that's really the focus of today's presentation. There's lots of information available about um, high wire tomatoes or, or, or plants to be grown commercially in greenhouses, but there's really very little information about these new compact cultivars that are uh, supposed to be um, grown in this light limited environments or space limited environments, some using hydroponic systems that they need to be early yielding that, and that they uh, need to be low maintenance. Um, and so cultivar selection is really a big, big part uh, of, of this program, of getting this program started. Another area of focus is to try to uh, continue to do research on identifying the best type of growing system for this urban consumers. Um, and again, a lot of urban home growers like uh, to grow plants in hydroponics. And, um, and so we're doing some comparisons to see, okay, well, how would this hydroponic production compare to something grown in a container using substrate with a saucer? Uh, the same thing can be said about lighting. Um, how much light do we need? What type of lighting do growers need to use when, when trying to grow these plants at home? And uh, how does that compare to growing them next to a windowsill or outdoor in a patio or in a balcony? And finally, we want to expand our, our research efforts to try to better understand the consumer, to try to categorize the different types of gardeners so that the marketing strategies that can be used by growers and by breeding companies uh, can be targeted to those different types of consumers. And so we've begun to do some, to, we've, we've done some of that uh, research already, as you'll see in the next few slides, uh, where we're trying to identify some of those knowledge gaps, but we have um, 
several excellent collaborators here at the University of Florida with expertise in social sciences, in marketing, in ag economics. So we hope to continue to expand this, this area of research and just uh, get better information to, to make sure that what we do addresses the needs of those different consumers. So before I get started uh, and, and just show some of our research findings, I want to first thank our, our students and staff, the people in our group here who've led a lot of the, the research uh, and the trials that I'll be presenting today, and then also to our industry partners, uh, the breeding companies, as well as BioWorks, Syngenta, and Aerogrow. Uh, we've worked with them in, in several different projects in the last few years. And uh, also thanks to our friends at the Floriculture Research Alliance, who've provided a lot of the funding so far to uh, for us to be able to conduct this, these studies and support our students. So I'm going to go over one study that, that we published late last year. We conducted this a little over a year ago. And um, with this uh, study, essentially, we were after identifying the key knowledge gaps that home growers who use social media have with regards to hydroponic plant production indoors in particular. And so we use Reddit, which is a social media platform. It's one of the most popular websites in the US and in the world. And um, Reddit has several unique characteristics that make it suitable to use data mining tools to, to collect information. And one of them is that it's based on, on the use of online communities or subreddits uh, that are essentially these online spaces where people with common interests uh, interact with each other and share experiences and ask questions and get answers to questions about, uh, again, topics that are of common interest. So with this study, we uh, selected four subreddits that were, again, uh, highly relevant to hydroponic plant production indoors. And, uh, and then we downloaded all of the available information for a period of, of over 10 years and, and then went over some of the questions and the answers to try to identify the most common questions as well as the types of answers that are given. And so here I'm highlighting two of the, the four subreddits that we used in the study. Uh, and the reason I've included these screenshots is because um, since we conducted this study again a little over a year ago, the number of members or the membership in these two particular subreddits have, has more than doubled, which again shows that there is a very large number of home growers who are very interested and thirsty uh, for information to be able to succeed uh, when growing these plants at home. So just for fun, I've decided to include this slide here, just um, a few of the posts that you commonly see in these different subreddits. Again, we have to keep in mind that the, the, the people uh, who, who post questions and engage in these uh, social media platforms are not horticulturists or non-experts, but that is really a lot of, of the consumers for this market, people who don't necessarily have a strong background in growing plants. And so we need to be able to, to find appropriate ways to educate them so that they're able to succeed with these activities. And so I'll go over this three different examples. On the left, we can see someone wondering what is going on with their tomato plant, what are they doing wrong? And um, and this is uh, what we call intumescence or oedema, and I'll go into details about intumescence in the next few slides, but it's a physiological disorder that is very cultivar specific that affects tomato and pepper plants, and that given the right conditions, they'll just continue to develop and, and lead to something similar to what we see on this picture. And, and it's something that if a consumer sees that they may feel discouraged to continue to garden because they may think that they're doing something wrong. And in this particular case, it's really just a matter of identifying the best cultivars to grow in under these conditions and using these systems. 
Uh, the picture on the middle, we see someone uh, saying, why are my tomatoes not ripening? It's been like this for two weeks. And this, that may very well be me because I'm one of those consumers who wants instant satisfaction. I want to be able to harvest a fruit very quickly. Soon after I see a fruit on my plant, I want to be able to get something out of that. And so identifying early yielding cultivars is also important. And finally, we see uh, on the upper right, we see someone saying, well, my my bell pepper plant doesn't really look like a bell pepper plant. Uh, and they're asking, is it supposed to look like this? And so um, this is just to show that a lot of the consumers, again, may not be able to tell the difference between a pepper plant or a lettuce plant. So there is a lot of opportunity for us to help educate consumers and make sure that they are able to succeed so that they can continue to engage and continue to go back to our industry to, to purchase products and, and continue to grow plants. So going back to the, the data mining study, here's a frequency graph just to highlight some of the key findings. Uh, what we found here is that um, we, we essentially had 10 very different topics, um, all relevant to indoor plant production in hydroponics. And, and we found that among the thousands of questions that were asked, 50% of those questions pertain to these first three topics production system. What type of hydroponic system should I use? Should I grow plants in hydroponics or in a container? What type of lighting system? And that is something that continues to come up. Um, what type of lamp should I purchase? What type of color should I use for how long? Um, and again, lighting is one of those topics that, that is, is always of interest to a lot of these indoor growers and then root zone environment. And that essentially covers anything related to the nutrient solution, like um, frequency of, of nutrient solution replacement intervals, um, electrical conductivity, root zone pruning, and just lots of questions pertaining that nutrient solution management. And then, as you can see, we had several other topics with various levels of, of interest in terms of questions. So the second biggest finding that we uh, had from this study was that regardless of topic, uh, there was less than 50% accuracy in most of the responses that were given. And so what this tells us is, again, that there is a lot of misinformation that's being shared in these social media platforms because the people who provide answers at, are at times non-experts in and may not be necessarily providing the best advice for growers to succeed. So again, there's a big opportunity for, um, for us to provide information that, that addresses the needs of these home growers. So another big area of, of research that we have is focused on the lighting requirements of the crops. And, and that is because there's a lot of information available um, about some of the requirements that, that vegetable plants have when grown in a greenhouse uh, at a commercial scale in order to maximize quality, to maximize productivity. And so for example, we know that commercially, leafy greens and herbs should be grown under 10 to 20 moles per square meter per day of, of light. Uh, that is the daily light integral or DLI, which is the total amount of light that plants would get within a 24 hour period. And then crops like tomatoes and peppers, well, those benefit from more than 30 moles per square meter per day of light. And so realistically, those are very high numbers for a home grower to be able to provide at home here. We see one of those countertop hydroponic systems in the lower right of the slide. And, and you can see, I mean, it's very unlikely for one of the systems to be able to provide the DLIs that are recommended for commercial production. Um, and also we have to consider that the light intensity for human comfort and, and function will actually result in a DLI that is lower than one mole per square meter per day. So we are after essentially what is the lowest DLI that we have to provide to these plants for consumers to be able to produce something that they'd be that they feel satisfied. And so one of the first trials we conducted in this space was looking at those the lower DLI that we could possibly use to um, continue to grow a lettuce, something that was purchased in a 
this door and then transplant it and put it indoors at home? And uh, how little light would a home consumer have to provide to be able to maintain this plant and continuously harvest some leaves from this lettuce? So uh, we found that between seven to 10 moles per square meter per day are, are enough for consumers to be able to, to harvest um, a high quality plant. And with that, I mean, we measured things like anthocyanin, uh, we measured chlorophyll content, aesthetic quality, and, and of course yield. And so essentially half, about half of the recommended DLI for commercial production is really enough for a home consumer to be able to maintain a lettuce plant indoors. And so we had a, a somewhat of a follow-up trial where we compared two different lettuce cultivars, different colors, purple and green ba uh, basil, I mean. And uh, with that study, we found very similar results. Uh, essentially, home consumers could easily provide less than half of that recommended DLI and be able to obtain very good harvest from this plant when grown indoors. So last summer, we conducted uh, somewhat of a similar study, but with tomato. And again, there's, there's really no information available to tell you how much light does a tomato plant need to be able to be grown in one of these uh, home environments. I mean, uh, with this particular trial, we grew eight different cultivars, I believe. And, uh, and here I'm showing pictures for Red Robin, which is one of those very productive compact tomato plants. And, and we grew them under three different DLIs. Our lowest DLI was 10 moles per square meter per day. And that is one third of that recommended DLI for commercial production. Our highest DLI was was about 18 moles per square meter per day. And then we had something that was in between, kind of in between, but we had two different strategies to provide that middle DLI. Uh, we, we provided one treatment with a short photo period, but a high intensity or a long photo period and a low intensity. So the same DLI, but you can clearly see from this picture that there were differences in morphology and the shape and the size of this plant as well as yield. And so with this experiment, we found that as expected, Plants grown under the highest DLI have the highest yield, the highest productivity. However, the plants that were grown under our lowest DLI produced a good enough harvest. And, and why do what do I mean with that? Well, I've had conversations with, uh, with people who've been working in this space for many years. And, and they've told me that based on their experience, a, a home consumer would be satisfied if they're able to harvest 10 fruit from one plant. And so when we're using a cultivar like Red Robin that is super productive, a plant grown under 10 moles per square meter per day will definitely produce much more than those 10 fruits. Um, another thing is uh, to consider is that because we harvested these plants at a certain time, uh, we see these very large differences in yield. However, if the plants grown under our lowest DLI were allowed, would be allowed to grow for a, an extra month or a few more weeks, uh, it is likely that their yield would continue to increase and perhaps approach a little bit more uh, the yield that was obtained under those higher DLIs. So here's uh, uh, another slide from uh, showing results from that study. Here's another cultivar, yellow cannery. And um, with this slide, I really just want to highlight or stress the fact that providing that higher DLI to maximize productivity might not necessarily be a good strategy for indoor home growers. And, and that's uh, because of issues with intumescence, which I mentioned earlier, it's a physiological disorder. This particular cultivar is susceptible to it and it seems to be much more susceptible to intumescence under higher DLIs. And so, even if it doesn't necessarily, and it may, but even if it were not to affect yield, a home consumer would still see a plant with a lot of senesce leaves and they may be worried and they may think that they're doing something wrong when in fact they're not. Whereas if we look at the pictures from the plants grown under those lower uh, daily light integrals, those look like much more healthier plants. And, and thus for this type of cultivars, perhaps using those lower DLI ranges might be, might be more appropriate. 
So here are a few more pictures about intumescence. Some of the pictures that we took in our previous trial uh, where we found uh, we grew about 19 cultivars in our indoor environment. And uh, about half of those cultivars developed some level of, of intumescence. Um, and, and the injury levels or the severity of the injury really vary depending on the cultivars and the conditions. So just to clarify, um, intumescence, again, it's a physiological disorder that it's thought to be caused by the lack of ultraviolet radiation in the growing environment. And so what happens is that now we're growing plants under LEDs, uh, most of which do not emit any ultraviolet radiation. And then we begin to see problems like intumescence, which again are very cultivar specific, but do affect solanaceous crops like tomatoes and peppers. And so here we see three examples in tomatoes that show the different levels of severity. Here we see uh, the injury uh, on the pepper plants and it's a, it's a different type of injury. We see that on the underside of the leaves and we see these little bumps. And again, home consumers might be worried that they're doing something wrong when in fact they may not be doing anything wrong. So uh, we have, we're currently conducting a trial uh, where we're looking at strategies to help overcome or minimize intumescence in this indoor environment. That is because there have been some studies that have successfully shown that the intumescence can be suppressed indoors by either providing some supplemental ultraviolet radiation or by growing plants under very blue rich environments with a little bit of far red radiation. And so in the image on the left, you can see uh, one of our growth chambers where we have different treatments. And you can see that those very blue spaces, that is the recommended strategy to overcome intumescence. And, and for commercial production, that might be appropriate. But for uh, home gardening, where you're going to have a system in your kitchen, in your living room, home growers might not necessarily want to have something emitting this very blue rich environment or may not be may not want to be exposed to ultraviolet radiation at home from lamps. And so we're looking for strategies to help suppress intumescence using light quality, but focused on using treatments that are essentially based on white light and then are supplemented with different colors of light. And we're seeing very promising results in, in um, finding alternative ways to, to suppress intumescence uh, that could be applicable to home consumers. So uh, our work so far has focused on tomatoes, but we hope to, um, to continue this work and, and work a little bit more on identifying solutions for peppers. And so with that, um, my colleague Paul Fisher will be um, going over the rest of the slides today. Thanks very much, Selena. Well, uh, welcome everybody. I'm really glad you could join us today. And Selena's been talking about indoor growing. And that's one aspect of what we're going to show you today. And, and she'll explain that we're growing these different cultivars, both indoors as well as in a greenhouse. And uh, there's a lot of exciting new technology that's available for growing plants indoors. And it's opening up plant products to a whole new demographic. And a lot of these young urban consumers are gonna be as excited about having an app to control lights as they are about growing the plants. And uh, here at UF, we've been involved in various aspects of helping to develop these systems and test them and also look for opportunities to make uh, consumers more successful with, with using these systems. So Selena, can you go to the next slide, please? So uh, one of the things that we're looking at is indoor versus sunlight growing and containers versus hydroponics and looking at some of the pros and cons for those different systems. We can grow very good quality plants, both flowers and vegetables in both systems. And we work with a number of industry partners, substrate companies, container companies, as well as hydroponics. And really we've got some different types of consumers. We've got consumers who are going to be growing these plants in the soil. They'll have plants in a container on a patio, and then we'll also have some indoor growers. And this is just one example from uh, one of our graduate students, Jansen Gedward. And I know that with such a, a short presentation, um, we're only representing one of the possible combinations here of, of different growing conditions, but 
with the particular light level and light quality and particular fertilizer and so on that we're using, we were looking at if we took some floricultural crops and in this case tomatoes and we looked at yield both in sunlight and indoors and in containers versus hydroponics, would we get uh, an acceptable per plant performance? And we did in all of these growing situations. And so uh, we've got the highest yield in this particular experiment happened to be in containers and in the greenhouse under sunlight um, and lower in hydroponics. But uh, for any of you hydroponic oriented uh, growers, if we change some of those conditions there, then I'm sure we could get um, very similar yield or even flip that difference. So we've got different markets, we've got different ways of uh, growing, but it's really our responsibility to make sure that all of these different kinds of consumer have success with the plant products that we produce. Next slide, please. So one of the things that we've also done, I, I'm really a floriculturist, I'm learning about growing vegetables, and we just tried putting some flowering crops in some of these indoor growing systems, and uh, they look very, very acceptable. And so these are liners of uh, marigold here, uh, geranium, calabricoa. Uh, we have some vinca, some petunia in there. And we're growing them under LED lights in a system that's really designed for leafy greens and, and uh, tomatoes. And uh, very interesting that they, because of the light quality, which is different from sunlight, without, for example, having any far red light being produced by these LEDs in this particular lighting setup, this was white, red, and blue LEDs, these plants are very compact, but very floriferous. This is absolutely acceptable. And I think it opens up an opportunity for us to use some of these excellent floricultural crops for a completely different use for our apartment dwelling uh, consumers. Next slide, please. And we've focused so far on lighting, but as Selena mentioned, another big area that consumers are interested in terms of hydroponics and indoor growing is the root zone environment, water, fertilizer, substrate. And so I'm really a root zone person. And uh, so I have a couple of students here, uh, Fernanda and Chase, who are just uh, finished a, a little trial and what we're looking at is different nutrient delivery systems. And we're trying to simplify this for a home grower. So one of the options is to put controlled release fertilizer, CRF, into the transplant. And so there what I can picture is that uh, basically a, a greenhouse grower is producing a, a plant in a container and either at point of sale with uh, the top dressing of a controlled release fertilizer or else incorporating that CRF, you've now got a package which has got the right cultivar, it's already established, perhaps it's got some immature fruit or flowers on it, and it's also got the nutrient charge. Another option that we've looked at is putting that controlled release fertilizer into a tea bag that goes into the reservoir, and I'll show you another slide on that. This is Fernanda's master's project, and we can deliver nutrients for several weeks without having to uh, add any additional nutrition. Another option, which is based on the Scott's Miracle Grow uh, program, where there's a sachet of water soluble fertilizer that's added into the reservoir once a month, uh, is also uh, a very good uh, option. It, it works surprisingly well. Um, but then there's additional kinds of um, uh, adjustments that we could make. For example, um, adding, um, adjusting pH once a week. And so these were all different options that we used with some indoor uh, hydroponic growing systems. All of these systems provided very acceptable plant growth. And some of them are frankly going to be simpler than others. Next slide, please. So one of them, for example, in Fernanda's project is she is looking at controlled release fertilizer, polymer coated fertilizers that are going to slowly release nutrients a tea bag put into a reservoir at the beginning of the crop and then just leaving it and uh, seeing how the plants grow. And so we've got increasing number of coated materials 
available. Calcium and nitrogen are two key elements in hydroponics and a coated calcium nitrate fertilizer will release nutrients over a period of time at a very consistent rate because of, we've got fairly uh, even temperatures indoors in a, in a home environment. And on the right hand side, you're seeing that uh, we've got two different rates of controlled release fertilizer blend compared with a water soluble fertilizer growing basil and we can do at least as well as that retail type water soluble fertilizer using a controlled release fertilizer approach. And uh, what we're now doing is really focusing in on pH buffering. So we can deliver all of the nutrients with our tea bag, controlled release fertilizer, but pH management is more difficult. Next slide, please. And with that, I'll hand things back to Selena. Okay, well, thanks, Paul. And uh, this is really our last slide. Um, well, it's, it's not, but it's almost the last slide. And again, this is just to remind you that we do have reports available uh, from the cultivar trials that we conducted last year here at the University of Florida and in Singapore uh, at Gardens by the Bay. And so, um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the hope is that after this event this afternoon, you will receive an email with a link to a survey. And once you've completed the survey and included your email address, we should uh, be emailing your, a link for you to be able to access these reports as well as brochures from the different breeding companies that will be presenting next and some of those presentations. And then a summary of our current cultivar evaluation will be emailed to everyone within the next couple of months.